but okay. so Tiffany, you do a couple things. Yes. You do uh, the nonprofit that you've been doing forever. And yes. You do. You show people how to turn their properties into income. Yep. So tell me a little bit more. Wherever you want to start, if you want okay. to start with one or the other, you start. But tell me like the whole story. It's probably probably easier to start from the nonprofit because okay. then I graduated into real estate. Just yeah. so it's like a chronological order. Yeah, I guess. yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, um, long story short, I grew up really quickly. So, at 15 years old, I was the second case in the state of Utah to become a legally emancipated minor, meaning I no. divorced my family wow. legally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An so, emancipated minor. An emancipated. At 15 years old, the second case. Oh my I'm sure goodness. there's more now. Yeah, there's, yeah I'm sure. Right. But, um, and it was due to abuse. Okay. I had suffered all forms of abuse. My stepfather went to prison for molesting me and my sister. Um, who was her biological father, um, left home, you know, when the, the rest of the kids were very young. So uh, my sister was abused after I left the home, so I didn't know what was taking place. And my littlest brother, my youngest brother, didn't really even know I existed because mm -hmm. he was just a baby when I left home. Yeah. And um, because I was emancipated, I could check myself in and out of school, which was kind of cool. Like, I could write my own notes. Please excuse Tiffany Barnes for being late. Thank you, Tiffany Barnes. And my teachers would have to take it. Or, you know, I didn't have somebody saying, get up, go to school, wow. do the right thing, get good grades. But I still graduated top of my class. Um, I was a strong scholar, full ride scholarship to the University of Utah with honors and leadership. Wow. Um, but kind of the, the, what I was getting at was not to sit and boast about myself. <laughs> no, but to impress upon everybody like the journey. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, but yeah. Um, a lot of kids were like, why are you writing your own notes? I don't get to write my own notes. Where are your parents? You don't have parents at home. We're going to have a party at your house, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I was just renting a little basement apartment up in Sugar House at the time, but commuting to Kearns High because I knew I wanted to go to the U. So I was like, let me move up there now. And yeah. just finish out high school, and then I'm already there. Yeah. So, um, rented your own apartment? 500 yeah, bucks a month. You should have seen the look on these oh people's face gosh. when I show up, and I'm like, I'm here to rent the apartment. And I was like 16 at that time. Oh my goodness. And it was this couple that was um, doing their residency yeah. in medical school, and they looked at me like, Are you punking us? Like, yeah. no, you're a runaway or something. Yeah. So I always had to carry my papers with me to show like I was legal and I was emancipated and I was my yeah. own guardian and all of that. So, wow. so it was interesting. My senior oh, year, I worked three part-time jobs. So the school gave me a work release where, <clears throat> excuse me, I left probably around 12 o'clock and I worked at ShopCo and cashiered for four hours and I got school credit for it. Oh, wow. And so um, it was the one out off of like 54th and Redwood. There was a restaurant called Frontier Pies in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And so I'd leave, you know, 12 to 4, work at ShopCo. Then I go do a little bit of homework for an hour or two and then go waitress at this place called Frontier Pies. Wow. Until like ten o'clock at night. But that was it was my savior. Like really it was because wow. I was able to use the money I got that night from waitressing to buy milk or bread or get on the bus to go home or oh, you wow. know. And then on the weekends I folded towels at Bed Bath and Beyond. <laughs> so Are you serious? That's where I started. The, that's where this girl started. Oh my gosh. This is definitely well. This is definitely one of the first for me, like this kind of story, but it's a yeah. beautiful story. Like, um, so what happens next? So what happens next is, uh, so kids were coming up to me, like I say, saying, yeah. what's your situation? What's going on? And I said, well, I was abused and I'm emancipated and all these things. And kids were just coming to me in droves, it felt like at the time, saying, I'm being abused and I've never said anything to anybody. Wow. Or I know someone who's being abused. And it was kind of, I call it my Tiffany epiphany, my little <laughs> light bulb that went off. And uh, I said, I need to start a group for kids like me where we can just get together, do homework, we can be a shoulder to cry on, we just talk it out, whatever. Yeah. And that little group of 10 kids, which we called SHARE, that was the name of our club at oh, the time. Oh, wow. And SHARE at the time stood for Students Helping the Abused React and Empower. Mm. So we just helped each other react in a positive way because where I went to high school at Kearns High, it's, you know, there's a very mixed group of kids there. There's a lot of sure. gang activity and stuff like that. Okay. So we didn't want to turn to games or teenage pregnancy or drugs, which was very prevalent around us. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody in that group said to one of their friends at Granger High, 
hey, we've got this group going on. It's really been a, you know, a saving grace for me, whatever the case may be. I don't know exactly what the conversation yeah, was. Yeah. And they said, I want to start this in my high school. And then I was starting to give talks to administration and kids on how to recognize the signs of abuse, how to report it. It's okay to say something, you know, yeah, all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And it's now snowballed into a 501c3 nonprofit. And wow. it's, it's still called SHARE, yeah. but it now stands for Sharing Hope for the Abused through Resilience and Empowerment. Wow. So, so you started that all the way back in high school? 1998. Holy cow. How did you, um, I mean, when did it, did it officially, like, paperwork start there? No. Okay. When no. Did, like, and, and not that that discounts anything. I'm just sure. curious about, like, so you have this group of people... It was officially, unoffic you know, unofficially official. Yeah. And then, it, and then it starts. Then you realize, like, this is a real thing that I can really help a, a people, someone on a large scale. Yeah. Right. It's my and purpose. Did, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so, when did that start? So I filled out all my paperwork probably around two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Okay. And you know, I paid about ten thousand dollars, get it going. You have to do bylaws and write up all these different things. Yeah, have do. an attorney and do attorney it. Do it. Yeah. Nonprofits yeah, Those and then it sat on somebody's desk for probably two years. I heard nothing. Wow. And um, I can't remember if it was my attorney. It probably was my attorney. He said, you need to write a letter to the legislature and say, hey, I'm trying to start a nonprofit. I've heard nothing yeah. for two years. And as soon as I sent that letter, approval. <laughs> so then I became legit, 501c3. Yeah, that's so. cool. Well, and, and, and like I said, we, we were talking about it before, I, the, whole, the whole journey of starting a business, and especially a nonprofit, like, that's a big deal. It's not like starting a sole proprietorship or like an LLC. Right. You have to get, there's a lot more involved with it, a lot more wait times. Yeah. But, um, but you start this, um, you know, this amazing nonprofit, and then you do you just keep going from there. It just grows, you get right. like a board and, and things go. Yep. Did the same people follow you through the whole process? Did you? No, nope, I have a different board now. So the oh, people no. that I started with, they're yeah. completely different. As a matter okay. of fact, I have a few openings. So if anybody listening <laughs> wants, to, <laughs> you know, wants to learn more about it or something, yeah. I don't no. know. Um, but because of what I did in my work with helping abused women and children, which yeah. I do truly believe is the reason I'm on the planet. Yeah. Um, well, and good. I mean, that's such a big, that and that you can talk about your passion too there because that's such a big deal. Like people really, it's scary how many how many women and girls are out there that are like, that that feel like there's no, nothing. And men do. too. I and think I. Yeah, I was telling yeah. you before the podcast. I have my own podcast where I interview people that have been through abuse, and I've been trying yeah. to get more of the male perspective because there yeah. it's one in six men, and one in four women before the age of eighteen. No, the numbers are that high. That high. Age so if you're in a room of thirty people and it's Something half like and that. half men and women, you just yeah. look statistically. There's people in that room that have been through it. Wow. Whether they've said something, yeah. you know, I I would choose to believe that there's actually it's it's worse, but not I, enough I would, people I, yeah, have maybe. said yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're more expert on that, but I would agree with you because people don't like to talk about it. I'm sure. Yeah. What, so why do you feel like it's such a hard thing to talk about? I mean, especially in today, I mean, earlier, you know, um, and I mean earlier, like in times past, you know, it might have been hard because maybe no one believed you, you were a kid, you know, um, and then, you know, there was like that discipline age where it was like your dad wasn't doing that, you know, yeah. it, was, it was like corporal punishment or something. Yeah. Right. But like in 20, we're in 2019, 2020, 2021, right? Right. What, what do you think is, what do you think is a, the biggest hindrance? I think a big thing that I commonly see is people are afraid to say something because they don't want to break up their families. Mm -hmm. They're afraid, where am I going to go? And that's something I personally faced. I didn't want to be a foster kid, hence sure. why I became emancipated. Oh, yeah. And I ended up wow. taking custody of my sister when yeah. she went into foster care because she hated it too yeah. and helped raise her. And so wow. I think a lot of kids are like, well, if I say something, I'd rather endure this and just make it to 18 and then... I can leave rather than having to go into a system, go live with a family I might not like, or sometimes, this is sad to say, they'll go with a family and they're being abused with their foster family, because there are yeah, families out there that will like do it just that. for the money, you know, right. and I hate to say that, but it's the truth of the matter. Yeah, I, yeah, and I mean, that's really tough, because it does, I mean, I, I've heard those stories too, where you just right. bounce around because no one can do it, right? Yeah. That's crazy. And not just with me, yeah. worldwide, because yeah. this is an epidemic worldwide. 
is I think when people see that they have someone to go to that's also been through it, they feel more comfortable and safe saying something. Yeah. You know? So, well, no, I, I really like that. So, I'm gonna, I'll ask you just a question that happened like this year. One of the big concerns about keeping kids from school that I heard mm -hmm. was that a lot of abuse is caught at school. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, because think about it. Like right now during I, yeah. Corona, there's yeah. a lot of domestic violence taking place because yeah. people aren't leaving their homes. Right. They're working from home. Kids, think about the kids that are doing the Zoom, you know, teaching. Yeah. And they're having to still be in that abusive environment. For me, school is an escape. Right, right. And the reason it was an escape is because I got out of the environment, but also I had positivity coming to me from my teachers. That's why yeah. I excelled in school. That's why I loved getting A's and yeah. getting 100% <laughs> is not just because I wanted a gold star. It yeah. was because who I was getting a gold star from. It was oh, an adult. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. And I wasn't getting that at, at home. At home. Okay. So, and, and one thing is, so I've uh, gone and spoken with like uh, the Principals Academy here in Utah okay. and showing, you know, hey, here's how you can recognize signs of abuse. Okay. And they'll have me come into schools and say, okay, on the front row, this person, this person, this person we suspect is being abused. But until the child says something, not a whole lot can be done. It can be investigated. Sure. But until but that's even that stuff, like yeah. with children, right? Because right. if you're going to question a minor, normally you have to have their parent with them anyway. Right. And so there's not a lot of that going on. Right. And so it's scary for those kids yeah, to tell the scary. truth, yeah. you know, and say what's been happening. That's there was a, sense. I remember giving a talk probably in the early 2000s down in Moab at one of their elementary schools. And there was this young man who had Down syndrome who was sitting on the front row. And his dad was a very prevalent um, politician of sorts in Moab or something. He held sure. some sort of an office. Sure. And the administration suspected that he was being abused, but his father held this high office in town, and yeah. so he was respected and all of this. And so the goal was, I gave my presentation, and then at lunchtime I would stick around and go to the tables and talk with the kids and be like, yeah. hey, do you have any questions? And then I'd have a social worker in a room with a camera if they wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me to finally come out and say something, yeah. and we've got proof of it. Yeah. And um, a lot of times these kids are just quiet because of the situation of they're scared to be ripped away from their home. Yeah, They've already been that. abused. Why do they want to say something about their father or their mother? They're afraid right. it's going to, you know, they don't think about it logically. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. They, they, it's fear-based for them. Yeah, well, and, and I mean, that's tough, right? Because it, it, it really is a lot of fear, though, when you're that young. Well, you experienced it, right? Yeah. I mean, it must have been terrifying. It must have been terrifying to realize, like, I, now I'm 15 and now i got to, I have to be an adult right. <laughs> before I, you know, before right. I'm supposed to be, quote unquote, right? right. I'm supposed to be. Jeez. So, what are some of the safeguards that are in place for children, like in schools, to like do some do some of these things to come forward? What's kind of like the procedures? You know, I think the biggest thing is just when you recognize it, saying something. Yeah. So that goes to the teachers, the administration, even parents, you know, that are just around the kids. Sure. So yeah. see something, yeah. say something. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people that say, oh, that's not for me to worry about. That's not my family. That's not for me to, you know, I don't want to be recognized as the person that has said something. You can totally be anonymous. Yeah. So well, re yeah, reporting yeah. Is, is number one. But then also knowing when you report, it's got to be investigated. So making sure that that child might have a safe place to go to a grandparent's home, a relative's yeah. home, somewhere, you know, that might be safer for them yeah. um, during the whole process. Uh, we have the Children's Justice Center here in Salt Lake City, and that's where I personally went um, when, oh. when I was being interviewed about the abuse and what was taking place. And, you know, you show up and they let you pick a stuffed animal. Um, which is comforting, wow, yeah, you know, and wow. I still have my stuffed animal just because it, it was wow, a, it was like cool. a safety, a friend for me. I don't know. Um, and that's the way, like, I journaled a lot, and I okay. named my journal Aubrey. So I'd be like, Dear Aubrey, as if I were writing yeah. to my best friend, you know. And so I think um, as a child, your creativity, but also your imagination um, can be good or bad for you, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, books were very helpful and, and they got, uh, and there's a lot of therapy, I'm, I'm assuming. Lots of therapy. And for me, I went through a ton of therapy and I don't want your listeners to take this to heart yeah. rather with a grain of salt because everybody's individual yeah. with yeah. what works for them. Sometimes it hurt me more than it helped me as yeah. far as therapy went. And it did depend on the therapist. 
people will say, how did you turn out the way you did? Yeah. And I think the biggest thing for me was writing. And that's when I would journal. You know, I have a book coming out soon called The wow. Throwaway Girl. And it's for me to sit down on a pen, with a pen and paper and get something out of the head that was never judged by someone else. Like, mm -hmm. I could say the worst thing. I could say the best thing. I could just say, just be authentic. Right. And do whatever you want. No yeah. one was going to read it. No one right. was going to do anything. Well, I, I think the journaling is very powerful for anybody and any... I think writing is a great tool because, yeah. um, you know, for me, I write down, like, when I'm really stressed, I do what I call it a brain dump. Oh, okay. Because I realize, like, what, when I'm, like, super stressed and I, I feel, and that's, like, the key word for me, like, I feel like I have a million things that are going wrong. Yeah. I write it down. I really, I realize that it's not a million, it's probably two or three, and then my next thing is, like, can I control it? And most of the time it's no. And then for me, it's a visually, like, logically, I can look at this and be like, oh, I shouldn't be worrying about that. And sometimes it's still hard, but at least I can see and I can work through this in my head. Like, right. Why is this such a struggle? Can I control it? No, I can't control it. Well, can I get out of it? You know what I mean? And I can, like, work through this. So I think a lot of, I think that's fantastic. And then, yeah, and then you can write down just like, oh. Yeah, get it out. So sometimes I'd burn it. Sometimes I'd throw it away and never look at it again. Yeah. You know, sometimes I'd just close the book and never look at it again. It just depends. But it worked for me. Yeah, that's really, you that's know? really nice. Well, and I, you know, I respect what you say about therapy um, being, you know, a virtue and a vice. Kind of thing. Good thing and bad thing. Because it does depend on the therapist. I've had therapists on here before uh -huh. who've said similar things. Like, you know, um, maybe I'm not the right person for them. Maybe there's something different we can try. Like, but um, what I think we all agree on, and even you, is it should be on the menu. Yes, like, absolutely. Therapy here. It's available. We should try it. We should do certain things. You know right. what I mean? We should try therapy. We should try journaling. We should try you know, hiking. We should try whatever, right? Well, and there's so many modalities within therapy. So you've right, got, like, right. the uh, the rapid eye movement therapy, yes, the I light agree. therapy, yeah. I agree you know. Yeah, and that worked for me. And I've actually done that recently. I went to an energy healers conference because I was speaking at it, and there was a gal that had a booth there, and I was like, why don't I try it? Or even Reiki therapy, just healing. You know, that stuff I used to think was so woo-woo actually works. So. Really works. Well, there's something interesting um, that we're, that the West that the Western culture is learning about, that these Eastern religions weren't whack. Right. There's something, there's something here. that they, The reason they've worked for thousands of years yeah. Right. And and again, like I don't di I don't discount therapy. I don't discount medication. I don't discount like great all like all these meditation therapies mm -hmm. because like dude, you just never know what clicks for somebody, right. what works for somebody. You know? Right. So I really like that. So your organization, um, the main purpose of it is to spread awareness. Do you, do yes. you deal direct? You deal directly with uh, the people who are affected with these things. Do you offer counseling and, and maybe? and things like that or what do you guys do? Yeah, so on our website we have just one main therapist who's a trauma therapist who I've actually also had on my podcast. His name's Joe Dennis okay. and he's very, very good at what he does. Um, he's also gone through a lot of trauma in his life yeah. uh, and the reason I mention that is I feel that it, it gives credibility to a person. You know, I don't want to talk to somebody as a therapist if maybe they haven't suffered some form of trauma. I sure. don't know, just for me, I don't yeah. give them the credibility. It's like, how can I tell you something and you're going to give me advice when you've never even been through it yourself? Yeah, you've never been through it. Yeah. And I'm not saying it has to be the same, <laughs> but some form. Yeah, something. You know, you um, so to, to answer your question, we started a Youth Empowerment Day in 2019, so last year, May. And it was our first annual. Uh, it was awesome. We had sumo suits. We had uh, we partnered with the um, Utah Families and Fathers Coalition of Utah, which is more geared towards fathers and families that have gone through, um, you know, very tumultuous circumstances. They came and brought their food truck. Uh, we had karaoke. That's cool. I'm also a part of something called the Kindness Revolution, which is about spreading kindness. And I represent Utah. Like there's one per state, one person per state that represents yeah. the Kindness yeah. Revolution. And uh, we had the Dalmatian there for the Kindness Revolution. We gave out bracelets. Um, we had shirts, you know, just all kinds of fun That's stuff. Really we had a bubble machine for the younger <laughs> kids. And the whole idea behind the Youth Empowerment Day is we wanted kids of all ages. I mean, all the way from, you know, 3 to 18. And we had a variety of activities and exercises for these kids. Even music. We had musical instruments if they wanted to pick them up and, you know, use that as a modality. Yeah. Um, and so what it was is it's just geared towards kids coming together for one day 
and having a place where they know the kids around them are suffering too. And let's put that all aside for one day and let's just have fun. Yeah, that's and right. let's just be empowered and and be kids. And be kids. Yeah, like and we're maybe they be yeah. Kids. And we had the boys and girls club there that you, you know kind of letting them know this is a resource if you want to start coming here after school and wow. um, so it was a great first annual and then COVID hit. Then so the May happened. 2020 did not happen. <laughs> so second sure. annual will really be third annual, but whatever. We'll just call yeah. second annual. Yeah. Um, so that's something I recently started. In conjunction with that, I went and approached the Salt Lake City School Board and said, hey, we want to do a contest with kids, um, these art classes within the junior highs and high schools. We would love for them to draw what empowerment means to them. Wow. And we're going to give away 100 bucks to the person that wins, which to a kid, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah well, great. Yeah. And so whoever wins, their design is going to go on the back of our T-shirt for that year. Oh, so um, the t-shirt turned out awesome, the, the gal that won, you know, what she drew, and um, actually the Davis County Convention Center approached me and said, we want you to display their artwork oh, wow. in the lobby for a month. Cool. So it's just kind of cool how yeah. things come full circle and open up. And, no kidding. Yeah. That's amazing. So, uh, you know, is there anything that I maybe I didn't touch on that you wanted to touch on about your nonprofit? Because I, I wasn't aware of the nonprofit before we had started the meeting. Yeah. So, I mean, I want this to be your floor. Like, is there anything that I didn't touch on that maybe you wanted to? Is it okay to give the website yeah, if okay. people want resources? Oh, yeah. So it's just sharethemovement.org. Okay. And the reason it's share the movement is we want to share the movement to stop abuse, obviously. Yeah, so obvious. if you go to www. I think I said too many W's, <laughs> sharethemovement.org. Uh, yeah. What you'll find on there is resources on how to recognize different forms of abuse, how to actively report it, yeah. um, resource numbers, hotlines. Joe Dennis's information is on there, which is our trauma counselor. If you want to you know, talk with me one-on-one, -on -one, there's a form you can fill out. We're also looking for board members, as I mentioned yeah. to you earlier. Volunteers, um, even if you just want to volunteer for a specific yeah. event or yeah. be a mentor. Um, and then that kind of goes hand in hand with the podcast as well. And I, I know we're on your podcast, oh, no, so I don't want to conflict. Yeah, no, but where, where do people listen to your podcast? So um, the, the podcast is called Speak Loud okay. Podcast. And it's yeah. because we want to speak loud and speak up against abuse. When I say we, it's me and the mouse in my pocket. Because <laughs> I'm the only one right. that does the podcast. <laughs> sure, but sure. Um, I guess I'm just talking about the whole world. We want to heal it. Yeah, um, we want to heal it. Well, and you know what? That's why I did the podcast. Like, did mine. Is like you know I've had other podcasters on here, I'm yeah. sure other podcasts because you know I I don't live in like a scarcity world. Like, That's awesome. Just because somebody you know just because somebody listens to yours doesn't mean they'll never listen to anybody else's. Right? Like right. I have like ten that I listen to like regularly. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So no, I love it, and that's the whole point is to give somebody a platform. So uh, now let me ask you this because my one of my what I felt was a calling for me along with helping small businesses and nonprofit organizations and things like that. It's like raising awareness for mental health. So have you how have you seen like the mental health aspect of uh, you know of the youth that's going on right now along with abuse? I mean I'm sure they go hand in hand almost. Right. I and mean it, being abused obviously affects your mental health and, and how do you deal with like the mental health issues too? Or the I, I'm gonna ask like fifty questions, but this is the last <laughs> one in the stream. Okay. But like, are the signs of abuse similar to the signs of maybe mental health struggles? Absolutely. I mean, they definitely go hand in hand. And one thing I didn't mention to you, because it sounds like I just rose above it like a phoenix and <laughs> sure. everything was good. Um, I was suicidal. Okay. I was anorexic. You know, I felt disgusting, no self-worth. I went through all of that, which a lot of kids do. And the suicidal part was just because um, if my parents didn't want me and they were the ones that brought me life, what's the point of being here? And I know a lot of kids go through that. Our suicide rates are going through the freaking roof. Oh, yeah. Um, I just spoke to the Hope Squad out at Stansbury High, um, out near Erda and Twilla yeah. last year. And they are the number one school in Utah for suicides right now. And it's yeah. just devastating what these kids are doing to take their lives. Oh, and, and like it's at such a young age, too. It's really sad. I'll tell you a story. Like one morning I wake up, it's like a Sunday morning, I wake up. I like to read the Wall Street Journal. I don't anymore, but be, partly because of this incident, you know, I'm reading it, and there's a there's an article in the Wall Street Journal from Utah, yeah, and about like suicide clusters, mm -hmm. and I was like, dude, like the number one killer 
of, of young adults, youth, I think it was like what, 12 to 24, I might be wrong on the number of age, but somewhere in that range, like suicide. Mm -hmm. Death by suicide is the number one. Yeah. That's so great. And then I went and joined the uh, crisis counseling. Oh, that's but, uh, great. The crisis text line. Yeah. Um, I, went, I was a counselor for like a year. Oh, that's awesome. Because I was like, dude, this is unreal. I cried in my room. I was like, yeah. I cannot believe. And, and the reason I the reason I was so emotional and I got so frustrated was because of the misconceptions about like the signs of abuse and the signs of suicide right. and the signs of mental illness. Like people were like believing like things that we know are not true. Like talking about suicide causes suicide. False. Like, right. We know it doesn't. People right. who don't talk about it are usually are usually the ones who end up doing yeah. it. You know what I mean? And I was like. Ah, uh, I was like, somebody, something's got to change, you know what I mean? So, yeah. anyway, that was just my experience, because I was like, you know, mental health is such a big deal. Well, and, and a lot of mental health comes from Trump. Right, and it's something, I mean, I'm 38 years old, and I'm still a work in progress. I'm not here to say sure. it's rainbows and roses and sure. flip switches, and yeah. you're all good to go. Yeah, I don't think that You know, um, I'm still single, ready to mingle for anybody yeah. who wants to put in an application. That's right, that's right. No, I'm just kidding. Um, everybody's, like, sending me apps. I like it. That would be cool. But anyways, um, yeah, it's just what I was getting at is I am very particular in even who I date. Because yeah. I know that there's still things, because I was sexually abused, I was all forms, sexual, mental, emotional, but sexual had the biggest impact on me, that it makes me leery in relationships, if you will. Even in business, I mean, this is a business podcast, you know, yeah. as a female business owner, because I do more than just my nonprofit, which I'm sure yeah, we'll get we're, into, we're yeah. but uh, even in business dealings with men. You know, I, I tend to be, I still have that trust issue a little bit, you know? Um, and it's, it's a work in progress, like I say. Yeah, how, so. do, you, how do you, you know, work through those? Because I'm, I'm sure, I mean, obviously, without a doubt, they're very real. So how do you approach those situations? Like, so, especially in business, you know? Right. I mean? Yeah. Well, the biggest thing is it starts with me. You know, it has nothing to do with you. You're a man. I could have an issue with you because I'm sitting across the table from you, which I don't. Sure, but sure. But I understand what you're saying. Especially in real estate, which is my, my forte and where I've made my money, okay. you know, there can be very aggressive males. It's a male-dominated business. Yeah, sales is tough. And so um, once I see that aggressiveness come out, I, I can sometimes associate it with narcissism or they're going to be abusive or they're going to be manipulative mentally or things like that. And so I have to realize it's me. It's my perception that I'm spewing on that other person. Now, if they are legitimately showing signs, then, of course, maybe they're a narcissist or whatever. Sure. Stand, um, stand clear. Yes. But, <laughs> so for an example, like right now I'm reading a book called The Untethered Soul. I'm doing a lot of soul work. Um, I just read the, a book called The Power of One by Eckhart Tolle. And so I'm really starting to get in touch with what are some things I've blocked out in these 38 years um, that are now coming to the surface and I'm dealing with. I do Reiki uh, two times a month, so every two weeks. And sometimes I'll walk out of there just bawling my eyes out. And I'll say, why am I paying for this? And the Reiki master will basically say, you, we're all like an onion. Yeah. You know, there's so many layers to us. And sometimes you peel back a layer of yourself, that onion, so to speak, and that's where the darkness is that you've gone through, that you've been carrying and burying like a trash compactor. Yeah, yeah. And it comes to light, and then you get emotional, and things come back up from your past, but you've got to do that quote-unquote shadow work yeah. to get to the light. Yeah. And I've had to remind myself of that, you know? And if there's a particular person that quote-unquote triggers me, which, by the way, if somebody triggers you or an event triggers you, you're not completely healed. Right. So I look, there's something I'm still working on. Yeah, so if I find that a certain person triggers me, I'm like, what is it about them that is a reflection of me, for one? There's something about them that I don't like about myself, perhaps, that's a reflection of me. Or what do I need to do inwardly to not let this affect me? Because I can't just go get that person fired. I've got to still work with them. You know, so you've got to learn to adapt and to change well, and, and work. You know what's so funny is I've always said that too. Like, I think, I, I, like, when I'm teaching people, and I say that loosely, like, I don't teach people, I don't deal with other people, but when, when, when we get in those conversations, I don't like that person. I always tell people, I'm like, if, you, if there's something you don't like about that person, that's an unresolved something. Something yes. you do. Because, like, I've always said, like, the, the characteristics you hate most in other people 
are the ones that you have that you hate about yourself. Like yeah. if I if I hate overbearing people, I'm I'm definitely overbearing for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you know, and I'm and, and it's hard to explain that. That would be in a whole other hour conversation for me to try to explain why we have that one. But but I get what you're saying. Like right. those things that we see in other people that we don't like are reflect. We're just looking in the mirror. Right. I like because I like the the, the soul searching. Um, and it's def- I'm in, I've been in sales my whole life, and, and sales is tough, you know. And I just mean that in the sense that, like, even for even as a dude, like, I get in some some circles with in sales groups that are like very like sales aggressive, and even me, I'm like, I don't want to be here. Right. <laughs> like, it's tough for me to be. So imagine being a woman who's been abused That's only by men, you tough. know, and so you can see where that correlation can come in. Extremely but. Different. It's not for me to put on them, like I say. Sure, sure. It's a reflection well, that, of me. And, that's a, and that amount of self-awareness probably didn't come easy for you. No, yeah. The, the last two years, especially, I've, I've gone leaps and bounds. Sure. So, um, Good for you. you know, <laughs> there was a lot of narcissistic people that I worked with at a company um, for the last 10 years, and it did a lot of damage to me mentally, and it made me digress. And so that's when I started looking into more woo-woo techniques, yeah, you know, yeah. meditation and yeah. Reiki and, you know, the light therapy and all of that stuff. So. Yeah. I like, I, no, I'm, I'm about that. Like, I, I love, uh, I love the meditation. I'm, I'm a big breathing meditation guy. Um, I think there's a lot more of that that we don't, you know, get. Yeah. So I, so I like, but I, and I know I interviewed, I had a Reiki teacher on here. I had a yoga teacher on here because um, I like that stuff. Yeah. I don't know why it's such like there's still kind of like it's coming to light more now, but people still have the kind of woo woo thoughts, and I'm like I don't get it, man. Because like I meditate for, and, I, and again I'm a, I'm for medication, right? But I go there's no side effects to meditation. Right. You do it for an hour, you do it for a month, you do it for a year, and nothing happens. There's no side effects. There's no redness. There's no itchy. You know what I mean? There's yeah. nothing. You didn't lose anything except for maybe an hour. And you're not addicted to something that's yeah. harmful to you. Yeah, a pill or something like yeah. that. And so again, it's just it's on the menu, right? Right. So then, so then you start this nonprofit. You go through this journey. Right. And you end up in real estate. Yeah. So I started in real estate, second year into college. Okay. So what had happened is I was still working at Frontier Pies, and I had a gentleman come in that was a regular, mm-hmm. meaning he always requested me every time he came in. Oh, cool. And. Um, I knew that he was kind of dressed to the nines. He looked like he made a lot of money. And when you're when you're a uh, a waitress, yeah. you know you hear some of the conversation as you're dropping off the food or the water or refilling the drinks or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he was always talking real estate. Well, in my family, not a lot of people have owned real estate. Yeah. You know, my dad still rents to this day, even though I'm in real estate and have tried to get him into a house. That's a whole other hour episode. <laughs> um, I oh, It was always like the, not just the American dream, but the ultimate achievement for me to be able to own a piece of property that is mine. And uh, one day I just got some gumption and I said, you know, his name was Matt. And I said, hey, Matt, I noticed every time you're coming in here, you're always talking real estate. What kind of real estate do you do? Are you like an investor, an agent? You know, what do you do? And he goes, well, I'm actually an investor, but I show people how to invest in real estate as well. And I'm like, yes. Well, that's at a $10,000 price, right? You know, there's all those real estate mentors out there. And this was the first I'd ever heard of it. Right. And I had no business, you know, giving this man 10 grand. I didn't have 10 grand. I maybe had 10 bucks. (laughs) <laughs> and so it was discouraging to me. I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm not meant to be in real estate. You right. know? If I can't pay some dude. Yeah, if I can't. It, so it takes money to make money. Well, crap, I'm screwed. You yeah, know? I don't know. Um, and, and I kicked it around in my head for a while. Mm-hmm. And he still was coming in. And I don't know the amount of time specifically that went by. But I got some gumption one day as I was tossing this around in my brain, as I mentioned. And I said to him, I said, Matt, I don't have money to pay you but I have time, and time is money, right? And he's like, well, yeah, and he could probably see where I was going with this. Yeah, yeah. And I said, here's what I'm willing to do. Just hear me out. Yeah. I will make copies for you. I will make coffee. I will drop off your dry cleaning. I will answer phones. I will do any, I will vacuum floors in your office, anything to be around you, and just learn little golden nuggets of what you're doing. And, and I will do it for free. Just my time. Yeah. And he was like, seriously? I was like, yes. 
on top of working these jobs, on top of going to college, you know, yeah. and you couldn't get less than a certain grade point average with my scholarship. Yeah. So long story short, I did that for four to six months. Wow. And he came to me and was like, okay, I see your worth, your, your worth and your work ethic. And he says, I want to show you how to do your first transaction. I'm like, really? Whoa. And my first transaction was a um, basically an assignment of contract or a wholesale transaction is what people might know it as. Okay. And, you know, it was a situation where I controlled the property, I had the offer accepted, and I assigned that over to somebody else, and I made a... a a percentage like a broker, a broker fee yeah and I think it was like three grand but to me three Dude, grand was a lot, a of, money. lot yeah. of money on one shot like yeah on one deal one deal you know yeah and three and even if you went three months let's say you worked the six months and you got three grand I'm sure that was still like enough oh you know it was, what I, mean? I was like dude that's great oh I was so <laughs> thrilled so that's then cool. I did it again. I duplicated it. And that's the thing I love about real estate is it's duplicatable, you know, yeah. the strategies. And I made like four grand. So I'm like, okay, make a little bit more. Yeah. Well, because I was doing that, grades were suffering. And so I got yeah. sat down and basically they said, you're on probation to lose your scholarship. So if mm -hmm. your grades don't come up next semester, scholarship's gone. Well, I had fought so hard in high school to get this yeah, scholarship. The scholarship. Yeah. So I had to have a come to Jesus with myself, if you will. And I said, okay, do I pursue real estate and start making this money and drop out of college? Yeah. Or do I finish my degree, you know, get my $40,000 education, you know, not having to pay for it and no, all that. Yeah. Um, but I was getting a degree in communications. I wasn't getting going to be a lawyer or a doctor sure. or something that needed that. Okay. And so I don't recommend this for everyone. <laughs> But I dropped out of the University of Utah on a full ride scholarship wow. to pursue real estate. Wow. And it wasn't a situation that you could say, oh, just kidding, that didn't work out. Can I come back? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And I was kind of like, you're done, you're done. Yeah. And I just never looked back. And I'm not going to say that every transaction has been amazing because I've lost a lot of money, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in real estate. Mm. But every time I've lost money, it's been because of my ego. Because I thought I knew more than what Matt was telling me or another mentor of mine was telling me like, oh no, you know, this is going to work, blah, 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 whatever yeah, the case may be. Yeah. And uh, I did become a millionaire at 28 through my portfolio and I wow. still have a large part of that portfolio. So this is 10 years ago. Wow. And today, um, still doing good. Yeah, you know, I, I've had some, I've had some downs and had some ups, but I'm still rocking and rolling as rocking you mentioned. I have uh, Airbnbs. Uh, which is my forte. Okay. Um, I've got long-term rentals. I once owned a cell phone store, so I've done a little bit of the commercial retail space. Oh, cool. um, And then so, flipping houses. Yeah, flipping houses. So you just, uh, that's the whole thing. You, you do the, I mean, when I think real estate investor, I think of the whole, the commercial real estate, the long-term investing, the Airbnbs, everything yeah. like that. But I'm curious about the Airbnbs just personally for a minute. Okay. Uh, how do the, so you, how do those work? I feel like, those, are those any harder than a long-term rental? In my opinion, easier. And let me kind of okay. give you a background on how I got into that. It'll be right, very right. brief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, um, we got time. Go ahead. So with Airbnb, I have a couple properties in Rose Park, not far from here. Sure. And uh, I had a tenant. That, the, the problem with me being a landlord is I have too much of a heart. Yeah, hyper-empathy. Yeah, so I had a tenant that it was getting close to Christmas, she was behind on payments, she had young kids, and she's like, well, can I just pay this month in like two or three month increments to pay you back and get caught up so I can afford Christmas? And I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, you know, yeah. you know, feeling bad about it. And then we did this rigmarole up until March of the following year. Yeah. And she still was behind, and I finally had to evict her. Yeah. Which is a terrible feeling. So I evict her, get inside the house, and, you know, I crossed all my T's and dotted all my I's. You have to have these people in the house. If anybody moves in, other than yeah. this, you got to let me know. Well, it went from four people on the lease to she really had 12 people living in a four-bedroom house. Wow. Oh and um, they, they are bigger people. 
yeah, yeah. Uh, their ethnicity, and I'm, I'm not saying that racially to be prejudiced or yeah. anything, but they were harder on stuff. What I'm getting at is they trashed my house. Yeah, they trashed your house. They caused about seven thousand dollars worth of damage. Oh, so geez. I took her to small claims court, sued her, so I could yeah. garnish her wages, get the money back. You know, I yeah. did all that, which felt terrible, having to take money out of somebody's paycheck garnishing. You know. Yeah, that's tough. Um, and so I'm like, okay, well now what? I spent seven grand to get it back up to par to rent it out to somebody again, which I yeah. could face the whole thing. And, All over again. And that's just how long-term rentals work. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I have more than just that one. Yeah. Is just be prepared every five <laughs> years or so to put at least another ten grand into the property. Wow. Five to ten grand, depending on your tenants. Some people yeah. are just amazing. But I said, yeah. okay, I can do that. Or I've heard so much about this Airbnb thing. I could try that and spend a little bit more money to furnish it too. So let's sure. say instead of seven grand, I'm now into this thing fifteen grand. Yeah. And see what what happens. Worst case scenario, I sell all the furniture and I just go back to a long term rental. Right, so I had right. nobody that showed me how to do this. I'd never stayed in an Airbnb. <laughs> I knew nothing about Airbnb. Wow. I just dove in. Yeah. And did my due diligence. Now the thing I had working for me is um, I worked with a gentleman. And gentlemen might not be the right word for this guy. Uh, that had a show on A and E called Flip This House that okay. I had a contract with for I was with him about eleven years. Wow. And um, where was I going with this? I just lost my train of thought. Oh. What was the last thing I said? Oh, getting in the Airbnb. Oh yeah. yeah. But there was a, oh, I traveled with him. My goodness. <laughs> so I was gone forty weeks a year. Holy crap. So I was living in hotels. Yeah. So literally living out of a suitcase. And there were things within hotels that really made it a home away from home. Like, believe it or not, I loved Embassy Suites because they always had microwaves. And they oh, always wow. were bigger. They all were sweets. You're not going to yeah. check in and say, give me the sweet. Everyone's a sweet. Yeah. Um, you know, I love that there was a blow dryer so I could have a carry-on. I didn't have to worry about having to have a blow dryer and all these yeah. other things. You know, so I just kind of made notes of that. Okay. And I thought, okay, I'm going to make my Airbnb... Like, so kick ass. Is that bad to say kick ass? No, no, okay. Right, no, um, that it's going to be like the ultimate stay based on what I've experienced being on the road yeah. as a road warrior or whatever. So, I did all of those things in the house. You know, I did the blow dryer, I had the makeup removing wipes, I had the, you know, uh, shampoo and conditioner, and all those things. Yeah. And I just tried to put thoughtful touches on it. And I became a super host, like, immediately. You have to have 10, 10 um, yeah, five-star reviews, yeah, and so there's so many criteria yeah. you have to meet. And once you hit super host, then you become closer to the top of the algorithm of in the search. So I've had no training on it, and I am now booked. I just had somebody booked two weeks ago for September of 2021. Wow. So, but I have other people in 2021, sure. too. I am booked into about April of 2021 right wow. now. So well, yeah, Airbnbs are. I I've heard I've heard really awesome things. Like, what's your overall experience been? Pretty good. Yeah, you know what? I am looking to do this with all of my properties now. I have a lease that's ending mm. next March, and it's two streets over from my Airbnb. So I'm yeah. gonna turn that one. I'm not gonna renew their lease. Hopefully, they're not listening. Yeah. And I'm gonna turn that one into an Airbnb. Just so yeah. And the thing that I love about it, let me just give a couple of pros. Yeah. Number one, I'm not chasing money because Airbnb collects the money for me. And not only that, they collect a deposit on their credit card. Oh, wow. So if they damage the rug, they poke a hole in the wall, they take towels or you know whatever right, thing right. could happen, usually the deposit that's saved is anywhere from 1,000 or 2,000. You can set your own parameters. Sure. So, excuse me, I think mine's at about 1,500. And I haven't had to really make a claim. I had to replace a microwave because somebody burnt popcorn in it and it just like blew up in there. Uh, That's the only thing I've had to replace. I've had a towel come sure. up missing, but I'm like, really, am I going to worry about a towel? A towel, sure. Um, you know, there's good, there's bad. There's no smoking in the house. I've had people smoke in the house. So I have to charge the $200 fee to get the smoke out of the house, you know, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. But it's way less maintenance <laughs> and way less risk. Yeah. as you would see with a long-term rental, wow. and that's what I love about it. Yeah. You know, it's controlled. Yeah, it's a lot more controlled. You know, you rent it out. My tenant lived there, what, two years, and I never saw the inside to yeah. know all the damage that was taking place. With an Airbnb, I've had people stay. So during corona, I had, well, we're still going through yeah, it, but yeah. I had somebody stay six weeks recently. 
I wasn't in that house for six weeks, but I didn't have a worry about it because I knew that deposit was on the card. Yeah. And you I knew the money. I get the money as soon as they check in. Yeah. You know, and all is well. That's freaking sweet. Yeah. Airbnbs are cool, man. I, I, I've, you know, it, I, I've always thought that the idea of Airbnb was way cool. Mm -hmm. So I just really, I just really enjoy that. So then, you know, then now you're a real estate and you got your nonprofit. That's, that's so sweet. Yeah, I'm, I'm passionate about real estate because what it's done for me and my family. Right. Um, but I'm really passionate about showing people how to make money too. Yeah. So if there's listeners out there that there have properties that they want to turn into Airbnbs, you can hire yeah, me. Yeah, that's right. Hey, last question. Where did you come up with the idea? What, what caused you to go work for Matt, right? What mm -hmm. caused you to work for him for free? What, what gave you that idea? Like... It's such a good idea. I feel like if that's how you got to start, like that's there's nothing more noble than that. But where did you get that idea from? I think it was just a download, a divine yeah. download. <laughs> it must honestly. have been. No, seriously. Been. I've always had to be a problem solver slash creative thinker growing yeah. up so young. Yeah. Um, literally, like, do I pay this bill <laughs> or do I eat kidney beans for a week? And that was a reality for me. Sure, sure. So I think I've just learned to pivot, and I know that's the word of 2020, but right. I've been that way for a long time. Um, I know, 2020 I, ruined a lot of stuff. Yeah, it did. <laughs> So I've just learned to have to like be creative and have wow. to figure out, you know, how to maneuver my way through things. And so yeah. maybe that's how, I don't know. Yeah, that's I crazy. honestly don't know. It's been such a long time. Well, but no, but that's not, there's something very admirable about that. You know, that I, I wish, you know, one of the reasons I started my podcast is, is so that people can realize that they can turn skills into money. Yes. Um, and that the best way to further your life is just to invest in yourself. And sometimes you have to be willing to do that. Right. Like, I just want to be in the same room as you. So if that means I have to get your coffee, set your appointments, do whatever, right. there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? Like, if more people did that, I think that more people would be happy. And you did, and it didn't last long. Four no. to six months for you, maybe? Right, yeah. And he gave you, and he showed you how to do a deal? Yep. I just... Uh, I knew once I got in with him and he yeah. saw what I was doing for him and I gave it a hundred, yeah. that, that, it, that would it would come around to the if point. He, if he just saw me, it would work. Yeah. And could you think of that? Like, could you imagine that though? If, you said, if I said it a different way, if I said it like this, you have, to, you have to not work for six months, right? You have to not do anything for six months. You're not going to make any money, but, but at the end of six months, you're going to learn how to be a millionaire. Right. And what... And, who wouldn't do that? And then, but people are like, eh, probably not. I'm actually going to go spend a hundred grand and get a four year master's degree that I may or may not use. Exactly. And like, I'm not a college bachelor because I have a college degree. Yeah. And I, and I believe in doing what makes you happy. But when, but when I say things like that, you know, people kind of get mad at me, but it makes sense. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you get, like, if you could do that and if it was something that you loved, don't, you don't need to go to college. Like in this world, you don't need to go to college. Well, it's funny you say that. I've always said that as well, yeah. kind of the same sentiments. Yeah. But it's just, we're taught by our grandparents and their grandparents. Yeah. And it's just a generational thing that you must go to college. Yeah. You know, I've talked to people, why did you go to college? Because my parents told me to. <laughs> so your parents wanted you to get in all this debt, and now yeah. you're not even using the degree. And you're in a completely do. different field. Right, right. You know? And so I thought I got like a, gen, you know, a, a specific generic degree. But no, that that's what I like, though. That's why I like bringing people on. So... I thank you for being here. Remind us again, like, uh, your nonprofit website and then your own personal website if somebody wants to reach out to you. Sure. So the nonprofit is sharethemovement.org. Okay. And then Level Up Wealth Academy is my uh, real estate. Oh. If anybody wants to find me on social media, it's really easy. Uh, mm -hmm. Instagram, my handle is Lady Airbnb. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here, Tiffany. Thank you for having me. It's been awesome.